Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. You'll never have the sacred stone. <laughs> oh, this you crazy mother. Hey guys and welcome to today's show. Um, like I said before, Deet's next to me, we've got Richard below me and the topic today on the news section is, um, so we wanted to talk a little bit about Jewel, but more specifically about um, latest, the latest article that's come out now where Jewel is looking at age verification um, in their pod systems. But be before we really get into that, you know, what, what is Jewel? Um, Joule is a pod system device much like this here, you know, um, so this is also another pod system device um, that uses nicotine salts to mimic the experience you get from a cigarette. So what I mean by this is the nicotine absorption is much the same experience as what you get from an actual cigarette, right? When I, I'm just talking about nicotine, not all the other junk in there. Um, making it an extremely effective device for people switching from combustibles to e-cigarettes, right? Um, and then the history of Juul. Now, um, Pax Labs, formerly known as Plume, was founded in 2007. Um, Wiki says that it has received um, 46 million in US funding from various sources. Now, I couldn't really find exactly um, who the stakeholders were uh, or who the funding sources were, um, but they also got on to say here, now, PAX has been involved with uh, Japan Tobacco International, um, uh, where markets uh, where they market the products like um, PAX by Plume, a heat dot burn device that can be used to heat up uh, loose leaf tobacco or cannabis. This was released, this product, this um, PAX by Plume, this was released in 2016. Um, in the same month, uh, PAX also introduced another vaporizer called ERA um, that operates by heating concentrated uh, cannabis liquid. Okay, um, so that is just in short a little bit about um, the history of Juul. Now, of course, um, in 2017 in July, um, PAX Labs um, split off with Juul. Um, and you know, Jewel became a company on its own. Now I'm not really going to go into exactly who Jewel is owned by, um, or the directors, um, between Jewel and Pax Labs, but it is real interesting for me to see that, you know, what the history of Jewel is because originally, um, you know, Pax Labs was looking more at the heat, not burn industry, right? And um, Juul was just another product um, that came out of Pax Labs. So that's really interesting for me. I didn't really know that. Um, even though as I was reading it, you know, I was like, oh, yes, I remember Pax by Plume. I remember seeing these products in some vaporizer stores and, and that kind of thing. So then it all really made sense to me. Um, but another interesting thing I found, you know, on the success of the product, now, uh, the sales of Juul has increased um, by 700% in 2016. Okay, um, I read on an in an article, I didn't look at Canback Consults. Um, I wanted to, do, to start my math uh, looking at Canback's uh, presentation, but um, I just decided to Google how big the US vape market is. And I found a couple of articles that said in 2018, um, the US market was estimated at 3.6 billion US. All right. Um, and what they are saying is that Juul accounts for roughly 60% of the US vaping market, which pretty much um, tells us that uh, Juul is is worth about 2.6 or 2.16 billion US. You know, to give you an idea of, of the size of it. Um, I mean, if you're looking at 60% of the industry, that's what you're kind of looking at, right? 
did you guys find anything else interesting on the history other than this? I think the, the thing that strikes me the most about Juul, um, it was founded by two tech guys who, who were studying for their, for their masters at the, at the time and they kept taking smoke breaks and they figured, wouldn't it be nice if we had some alternative way to get our, our nicotine rather than cigarettes? And that, that's where the whole sort of uh, investigation into, into vaping started. <clears throat> but what strikes me about Juul is how fuzzy they seem about what the product is and what it does. I mean, I read a couple of, of articles that uh, quote their, their head of R&D, their CEO, you know, various heavy hitters in Juul. And the head R&D bloke said in the one article, said it's not a smoking cessation device. We I don't, read that. Eesh. Yeah, we, we don't intend it to be used as a smoking cessation device. Later in the same interview, he said it's not a lifestyle product. We don't want people to use it because it's cool. Now, if it's not a smoking cessation device and it's not a lifestyle product, what is it? And this is the strange thing about Juul. You know, most of these young tech companies, be it Google, YouTube, you know, Facebook, whoever, they have very, very firm views on what their vision, their mission, what their product does, what it's used for, uh, how it's going to be marketed to people. Juul seemed to have taken a deliberately vague uh, stance where they'll tell you everything that their product isn't, but not what it is. It's not a smoking cessation device. It's not a lifestyle device. It's not a tobacco product. Well, okay, but then what is it? They don't seem to have an answer for that. Yeah, I, uh, I found the exact same thing. I've actually got it written down here as well. Um, where did I put it? Um, yes, Ori Atkins, Pax Labs, R&D engineer said, we don't think a lot about addiction here because we're not trying to design a cessation product at all. He added, anything about health is not our, uh, is not on our mind, you know, which kind of like red flags everywhere while I'm reading that, you know? It does because it, it tells the whole story of the vape industry. Addiction is the one aspect of cigarette smoking that nobody in vaping wants to talk about because it's the one thing that vaping has in common with, with smoking is that it, it, it leads to an addiction. Uh, so it's the one thing that vaping wants to, vaping generally wants to distance itself from tobacco, but that is the one area in which it can't. So it's, it's kind of an area in which vaping companies don't really want to commit themselves. Another thing I found interesting, and this was raised by the, um, the Attorney General of Massachusetts, who's now going after um, Juul, investigating them for marketing to kids and, and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> she said two things. The first thing she, she said is that if Juul aren't marketing to kids, why did they choose Vice as their main marketing mechanism <laughs> when Vice is known as the number one media uh, sort of news channel or, or issues channel? And secondly, she said this, this 30 million that Juul have, have sunk into you know, researching underage vaping, she said that's a rounding error. And it is. I mean, the company's valued at, what, 15 billion or 10 billion, you know, 30 million is, is chump change mm. to them. As she said, it's a, it's a rounding area. It's something that in your books at the end of the year, you say, well, you know, we've got 8 billion or, you know, 7.97 billion. Let, let's just round it up to eight and use that 30 million on a, on a PR move to, um, you know, to tell people that we're, that we're not interested in underage vaping. So, there are some, some pretty serious allegations uh, against Juul coming out. There's been a lot in the news uh, recently, even, you know, things like Vox and Forbes and Fortune and, you know, various quite heavy hitting publications are, are starting to really lay into Juul about this, this whole thing of teenage addiction. And yet, if we listen to the CDC, the figures are that Juuling is down and has been for the last 
two years. So one doesn't know what, what the truth is. Is this as big a craze as the people claim it is? Yeah, I mean, you know, if, if you look at, if, if they claim that Jill accounts for 60% of the US vaping market, then, you know, it, it's, it's the majority of the market. So I wouldn't even call it a craze. You know, it's, it's the vaping market. If you look at it, you know, at a high level. Um, from a U.S. perspective, of course, we don't have it here. Um, we've got other pod systems here with nicotine salts. You know, I'm not sure if if it's the exact same um, uh, um, type of nicotine salts that um, that Jewel is using, but we have similar things here, um, but not that yet. So, but that I mean, that's what I'm reading over here. Um, what what lawsuits did you find? I mean, um, I, I read there's uh, I read that there's of course kids that are addicted to um, to jewel devices or jewel pods, and their parents are now going after jewel, right? Where is that Where is that lawsuit now? California, <clears throat> which ironically is is the home of jewel. I mean, they're a Silicon Valley company, so. Uh, yeah, these parents were saying that um, on, in the one case, uh, the child was an occasional smoker, would smoke on weekends, you know, maybe a couple during the week, then took up Juul and now is smoking in class, is smoking in the toilets at school, is smoking or, or at least vaping in class and in the toilets at school and can't concentrate on their schoolwork and, unless they've had their Juul and so on. And there's also been a big... Um, outcry about the fact that the addictive properties of Juul and the amount of nicotine in there isn't conveyed accurately and truthfully to consumers. People, even though, you know, there are warnings on the package and so on, people are not expecting to find 59 milligrams of, of nicotine in a healthy alternative to, to smoking. That, that is a pretty heavy nicotine shot. I mean, I vape two milligrams at the moment. If I took a drag from a jewel, I'd probably pass out. And I'm a 37-year <laughs> ex-smoker. Ex so it is, it's a mega dose of nicotine to be giving to a 13 or 14-year-old. You know, it, it's as bad as, as smoking, maybe even more so. Because the big thing that turns a lot of people off smoking is not, is not the nicotine. It's that, you know, the throat is so harsh, it tastes so nasty initially it the smell you know clings to your clothes and also that that's how you get caught out your teachers at school smell that you've been smoking that, that that's how people get caught when you jewel there's no smell there's nothing in your clothes um it's a very discreet device it's not bulky like like a pack of of cigarettes and it's giving this this big nicotine hit which is very smooth and very tasty so there's no real barrier between the child and using this on a regular basis. I mean, the cost would be a barrier to me. You know, four dollars a pod for less than a milliliter of juice. I mean, for four dollars, I can make you know 150 mils of of juice. So it's and that, that's another thing that's come up in the lawsuit as well. Is people are saying financial harms. The the one kid that got hooked on it now is now vaping a jewel pod every day. So that's four dollars a day, which is one hundred and twenty dollars a month, and the implication now is that he's going to have to do this for the rest of his life. So it represents a significant financial uh, outlay on his part and a financial burden uh, on his part. And this, I think, as with any new industry, uh, the bounds of how far they're going to go will be tested by civil civil law. So I think these lawsuits are going to have a major impact on the trajectory that vaping takes now. Because we have to, you know, people continually draw comparisons between vaping and smoking, but we have to consider that when smoking was popularized way back in the early years of, of the 20th uh, century, society wasn't nearly as litigation happy as they are now. I mean, there was nobody in 1915 who was suing uh, shops for giving them coffee that was hot or not listing, you know, the additives on their hamburgers or, or whatever. 
it's now a completely different world to what it was when, when Big Tobacco made its, its start. And anything that you do now that compromises the, the mental state or the lifestyle or the quality of life of a consumer. I mean, you can imagine if, if a fast food chain, if it had to be revealed that they were adding an addictive chemical into their hamburgers or sprinkling it on their chips or putting it in their, their sodas, they would be held to pay because people are now saying, you are messing with people's minds and their bodies and you're making them addicted to your product so that they have to keep coming back and buying your burger, your chips or your soda. And this is not, this is not fair in a market that's supposed to be free. You, you shouldn't be doing that. Now, why isn't the same going to happen to vaping where people are going to say, you are setting out with an ingredient that you know is addictive and you're putting it in your product and you gathering lifelong business that way. It's not fair that I should have to pay you because you addicted me to a product. I mean, Jewel will obviously answer, you should have known that nicotine was addictive, but McDonald's argued you should have known that the coffee was hot. They still lost. Yeah, uh, I agree with everything Richard said. Um, part of the, 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 the three cases, I read a, quite a few articles about this and the more I read it, the more conflicted I was about where, uh, who, who's right, you know. There was specifically one, one comment made here. I'm going to read it to you. Secondly, plaintiffs in two of the three cases admit that they were addicted to nicotine before they began using Juul's product to get away from their existing habits of smoking tobacco cigarettes. Juul didn't hook them. They were hooked before they ever chose Juul as their preferred drug dealer. After that, I also drug dealer. Watch, watch. Yeah, yeah. Look, <laughs> it's, it's, it's media. It's media, definitely. But the comment, the comment is still valid to me because it it chose them before they chose the, the product. Now, to me, that that said a bit more. And I watched a few videos about it, and then I noticed that it is heavily marketed um, around specifically where all these youths. Um, are getting into the, the dual craze and everyone's dueling, right? So you can't expect to flash people constantly with with advertisements of this product and how good the colors look and, and all of that and not expect kids to, to grab hold of it as a craze. It's a cool thing to have. It's a cool gadget. So you have to look at it from, from that side and, and, and then you see where, where these parents are maybe right, where they say, what we, 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 we try everything we, we could to not get our kids to, to, to either smoke cigarettes or vape. But, I mean, I can't close their eyes permanently through life. So they watch all these adverts and then it, it just becomes another product. It was also mentioned in another article. You see it so much that it's not something, something that you, could, you should consider. They don't stop and say halfway through the ad, this is like a cigarette. If you don't smoke, this is not good for you. You know, mm. they mention only, as you said, they mention only what they're not. So they mention that it's a safe alternative and this and that. But you must look at, at, at all the aspects of it, the media around, is it being advertised and so on, where cigarettes and alcohol is not advertised. This currently is. Mm. So this is what is being seen by, by all these channels. And Vice is a big, big um, portal for media like this to the use. So... I get both sides and I see all of that. And then the, the, the 59 milligram nicotine, that is, that is way, way more than, than even needed to get someone off cigarettes to be with nicotine, in my opinion. So, I mean, yes, there's warnings also. So if, if, if you don't look at it from the side where you say, yes, people are flashed with media about it, it becomes part of your opinion. Now you like the device and it's a craze. Then there's the other side where you say, look, uh, these people tried it they got up to the nicotine and it's it's their responsibility because the packet did state that there's nicotine on the packet can't you read there's also a lot of videos if you, if you just go into youtube and look at people um asking or being asked about uh the health risks of of the jewel do they know about it they've been vaping the jewel for three years and then they read the box I, i've never seen that it can cause cancer or it has contains components that might cause cancer or some disease. So there's both sides of it. People people see it a lot so the kids catch on as a craze, but people can read for themselves. You can read there's nicotine. So 
it's very interesting. And the more you, you see about it, the, the more you wonder about who's right and who's not right in their own right, you know? I think Jill are going to struggle to market this product internationally. Um, there's news coming in from Israel now that, it, that it's about to get banned there, not because it's vaping and not because it's dual, but simply because of the nicotine load in it. Uh, Israel is, is set to follow the EU's lead in only allowing up to 20 milligrams um, nicotine strength in, in vaping. So that automatically means that the dual is, is not allowed. For the same reason they're not allowed in the EU. The EU has a 20 milligram limit. Even Joule's uh, reduced nicotine one is, I think, still 30, 30 milligrams. 3%, yeah. 30 yeah. milligrams. So even that is 50% above the EU limit. Mm. So I think they're going to struggle to market this anywhere uh, than in, in the United States. Um, they've they targeted Israel as their first export market. Israel has now sl slammed the door in their face. Jewel have spent money trying to fight that ban yeah. and have it uh, overturned. So, you know, everybody's fears are materializing. This is coming, turning into big tobacco too, where you've got companies suing governments, mm. uh, you know, for what, for what they're doing. Uh, well, I don't know if Jewel is suing them, but they, they're certainly fighting. Fighting back, yeah. Yeah, fighting the legislation. So, you know, when, when people said early on in vaping's emergence that it was going to be big tobacco too, you know, it's it's pretty much turning out that way. It's mm. beco becoming the big companies versus the governments and, and so on. So it's a very interesting thing to, to watch. Uh, I think it'll take them a while to sort out exactly the tra trajectory that they're on. But in today's litigation happy society where, you know, teachers at school can get sued because they used the wrong tone of voice to the children, learners that were there, and it then caused mental problems for the child at school. You know, we're in that sort of environment, a company that sets out marketing a highly addictive product it's going to get pushed back at some stage in the form of consumers saying, you just cannot do this to us. But again, the flip side is that there is a legitimate need for it. Mm. You know, smokers need something that can, that can get them off cigarettes. Now, the, the smoking thing has been sort of sorted out with the master settlement agreement in the US. Big tobacco companies can no longer get, get sued, uh, but they're paying a percentage of their turnover every year. Uh, and there's a whole sort of regulatory and legislative structure in, in place to try and remove combustible tobacco out of society altogether. Vaping still has to go through that whole long brain damage process of finding out what it can do and what it can't do. And Juul, I mean, they single out Juul, but it's, it's not doing anything that other vaping companies aren't. It's just that Juul made the mistake of being the first to put its head above the parapet and to be announced as a vaping super brand. I mean, mm. Juul is, is the apple of, of vaping. So they're by far the biggest company. And um, they are therefore going to ca catch the most flack. They're going to get all the lawsuits and so on. Nobody's interested in suing a small company that makes drippers that you know only turns over a hundred thousand dollars a year. There's no there's no money to be made in, in suing a company like that. Mm -hmm. Jewel on the other hand. But again also if you look at the makeup and Jewel's market share, it shows just how out of the mainstream we are. Mm -hmm. I mean with our drippers and Jewel cell regulated mods and so on. I mean if Jewel alone is sixty percent of the US market, that leaves only forty percent that does the type of vaping that we do, DIY, drippers, regulated mods, etc. Of that 40%, there's going to be a whole bunch that are using pods other than the Jewel, or mm. are using Sigalikes, or are using, you know, Twisps or, or, or whatever. So we actually have very, very minority voice, even in vaping. Yeah, that's that's what, what I realized in our last show when we were looking at the vaping market is our, our perspective that we are kind of vaping and what vaping is, is not right. Our perspective is completely out, you know, um, and this, this is another thing that just shows us here, you know, um, 
or gives us more perspective on what vaping really is. You know, from if you look at it from a higher level, um, vaping yeah. isn't necessarily what we're doing. We hobbyists, you know, we looking at yeah. hobbyist things, um, and and you know, and we only looking at stores that sell these kind of elements, you know, or these products. We're not looking at you know, mainstream vaping stores because we're not interest, interested in cigar likes or we're not interested in dual devices. And, you know, pods have just recently kind of, you know, come into the scene over here. So um, it, it has changed my perspective on what vaping really is if you look at it from a higher level. We are the, equi we're the equivalent of class classic car restorers who think that they're representative of motorists. You know, they're not. They're a small enthusiast group, group within the within the broader, you know, motoring. Sorry, did you you were about to say? I was about to say, uh, Theo, you you both, you and Richard, you guys are taking all the words out of my my mouth tonight. I was thinking about exactly the same thing. Thinking back to last week's um, market research, I realized this week that, that definitely that market that that figures is possibly hundred percent right. I mean, we are on the forum. We are part of this, this, this very small community if you take the actual numbers into account. So we see vape mail every day, hundreds of them. But I mean, if you look at how many people are actually receiving this, and this is what my knowledge was based on. No, I see so much online purchases, and I myself purchase. But I excluded the fact that I'm part of a very small minority, the hobbyists. So... That's definitely definitely something to think about, and it, it, it also made me think about this during this this bit of research. Yeah, it's interesting. All of this. Yeah, I popped into my um, my local bottle store uh, just before the weekend, and for the first time, I noticed a a twisp display rack uh, behind uh, the counter, and they had all you know the various twisps and the juices and, and so on there. And it's the first time with this particular bottle store uh, that I've seen that. So. I think it's it's definitely vaping is is definitely becoming a lot more mainstream. It's becoming available in convenience stores, but it's all these you know pod and twisp and jewel type type systems. It's nothing like the stuff that that we vape. Mm. But understandably so. I mean, if if you look at the effort for to some people, it it might be effort. I'm comparing to to a lady at work who uses the twisp cube. She says she would never in her life. One to to work with coils or rebuild or get this atomizer and that atomizer. So it's definitely um, much more convenient for these pod devices. They are so easy to use. You pull it out, take a drag, and that's that. There's no buttons, no settings, no this, no that. So that if if if, if you consider vaping growth and new vapors, I would also put them more to the pod side than the the tanks and rebuildable side. Yeah. So that growth figures are possibly very accurate, I'm sure. Well, we, we, reconsidering my, my opinion from last week. We kind of stuck in generation three. This is, you know, this is, well, you, you know, so this is kind of a, generator, a generation three device. I mean, this is now Squonka, but if you look at a tank with, um, you know, um, a mod on it, that's kind of generation three. Now, in my mind, something like this, this is generation four, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so generation four, they don't care about flavor so much. You know, this generation here, this is more about getting a high dose of nicotine very quickly and that moving, keeps... moving on with your life. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's kind of just kind of disturbing that we've only been doing this for two years and we dinosaurs already. <laughs> that, that's what it comes down to. Their tanks. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it really is. We we kind of you know, you know, uh, when you uh, finish school and you stuck with a hairstyle till about like your mid thirties when you lose all your hair, it's the same kind of thing. You know, you just really like that hairstyle and that's your that's the way you live your life for the rest <laughs> of your life. You know, so we kind of like stuck in this era. You know, I'm, um, I'm enjoying it. So sticking around <laughs> for a while. <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been testing out uh, nicotine salts, and I can 100% validate the addiction, you know, uh, properties of it. Uh, it it doesn't give me a buzz 
um, it, you know, maybe a little bit, but within like literally within seconds, I can feel, okay, cool. There I got what I needed. So, you know, if you're sitting with this device the whole time and you're puffing away and you just filling up your um, body with nicotine like this, you're going to be creating a dependency, uh, you know, more than what you currently have. You can become more dependent or less dependent on a thing. And like Richard has talked about in our previous shows, you know, he's taken him a long time to get down to one per one milligram of nicotine in his juices. And, and that's when I mix, I mix up at one milligram juice. But um, in the pod system, you know, if I'm going to use a pod system, anything, you know, I tried mixing at 20 milligrams, you know, with nicotine salts and I wasn't getting what I was getting with the original, um, you know, I bought this here. This is a 35 milligram nicotine salts um, from BLVK, BLVK. Um, and I wasn't getting the exact same kick as I was getting from the 35. So it immediately was just null and void. You know, so I can imagine how difficult it's going to be for a guy that's using a 5% or 50 milligram pod from um, a Juul and wanting to go down to 3%, you know, 30 milligrams. That's a big jump. You know, it's, it's going to be... be it's going to be like quitting smoking to, to vaping. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be tough, man. You probably have to go, you know, 5%, 4%, 3%, 2%, 1%, 0.5%. You know what I mean? You probably have to do that um, uh, 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 to make it really possible for somebody to slide, uh, you know, to glide down um, nicotine slowly. Because when when I started, I was vaping 12 milligrams of just free base nicotine. And, you know, um, I then moved from 12 milligrams to nine and then from nine to six and then from six to three and then three to two and two to one. I mean, you know, that's not from 50 milligrams to 30, millig to 30 milligrams. That's, that's a little bit absurd to me. But uh, there's another thing I wanted to talk about, um, which was the age verification. So just back to this age verification thing, right? So in this article, what they're talking about is they're talking about a Bluetooth age verification. They don't talk, they talk about they want to implement this age verification on their devices to battle um, underage vaping, which, you know, is a step in the right direction. I give them that. I just, you know, when I was thinking about how they'll be using Bluetooth, now Bluetooth, you know, it itself can't validate your age. Of course not. You know what I mean? So it will, Bluetooth itself will just be the connection between um, I, you know, the device and a computer or a laptop or your cell phone. Then on your cell phone, there has to be something else like another application that can verify your age. So they can potentially uh, ask you to um, verify it through Google or verify it through Facebook, which I don't think is a bad idea. I mean, there, there are ways around that. So you can just change your age you know, and Facebook, because nothing stops you from doing it. You can change your age um, and then validate your product and then just change it back again. You know what I mean? To, to what it needs to be. Or you can change your age and decide not to show your age on your profile. Unless, you know, if, if this product continually validates your age, you know what I'm saying? Over time, then, um, Nobody can see what your age is on Facebook, but you can still vape your product. So you're kind of like jippoing the system, you know. So um, there must be better ways of, of validating. Um, I think the idea is right, though. Idea, the idea can be implemented um, correctly for validating age. I think by using automated systems, you know, there's always going to be ways around it. What did you guys think about that? I think there has been talk of using voters' rolls or social security numbers, uh, which I, I think can be quite effective. What would happen is that a third party serves as the validating agent. And there are closed communications between the consumer 
the validating agent and the vendor. So what happens is you get encoded communications between them. So, you know, if, you, if you're buying uh, a product, it checks to see that you're on the voter's roll. Uh, the validating agent uh, checks your social security number or checks whether you're on the voter's roll and then informs the vendor. But the validating agent doesn't know who the vendor is or what business they, they have with you. So it kind of protects your, your privacy. Um, you know, it means that the vendor cannot now use your personal in, uh, information because there's an independent and ring-fenced authority that's in between the two. So your vet, the vendor doesn't get any information about you. Um, it's just kind of a remote uh, activation means to, yeah. to verify that, you, that you're old enough, yeah, which I think has promise. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. That's why I said, you know, trying to automate this um, is a step in the right direction. Um, but I think, you know, if you're really going to get serious about this, if, if you are a company and you're worth 2.16 billion US, even more, you know, whatever the case is, this is just, this is just, um, you know, small little calculations that I've done over here. Then um, surely you can put in a verification. Um, you, I mean, Richard, you're talking about a third party, but you know, even if you don't want to do a third party, you can do it in house. So, you know, much like what we've got, um, you know, when, say, when you're working for a bank, you've got a, a FICA process that you go through. So you need to send your ID number, you need to send your, your ID, so copies of your ID. And then you also need to send a copy of that ID with your face next to it, you know, another photo. And then um, with all that information, somebody can FICA you and you can actually get a bank card. So um, much like that, you know, you can almost do the exact same thing here. You can verify somebody's age um, through creating, you know, in-house like a verification unit that, that does that for you. If you, if you super serious about this, um, I mean, I guess you can automate it as well. Um, but you know, there's just, there's ways around it. I feel. I think it's, it's a step in the right direction with the age verification, depending on how it's implemented. You must also keep in mind as, as a company, profit is still something they, they need to be concerned about. So if, if you make it too difficult for people to get the actual device and start vaping, it means people are going to turn away and go to something easy. And there's always going to be something else available. So they're going to have to work it out so that it's balanced. Simple, as simple as it is buying a device and taking a puff and vaping it. The process is going to have to be very simple for them. So depending on how it's implemented and how they control it, it can be a good thing. But also, if they go the extreme route, it can be a bad business decision for them. I'm not. I'm just saying, if if you if you are looking at all all points of view here, so for that reason, I don't think they'll go the extreme route. But then again, I can't comment because I don't really have an idea of how they will implement and control this. It's also interesting with this idea that you'll have of using Bluetooth to turn off their devices uh, at schools. That I would imagine, I mean, I don't know how teenagers think these days, but I would imagine that is going to cut, it's going to pull the cool rug from under Jules' feet completely. I mean, if a teenager takes his Jules to school and Jules themselves are turning that device off, you know, the, the cool value of their brand just goes into the toilet straight away. I mean, nobody wants a manufacturer that turns their product off when they don't want you to use it, surely. Yeah, that's insane, man. Uh, uh, nobody would want that. Everybody, I, I can just see like a million videos popping up on YouTube. How to hack your jewel at school. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say they're going to go back to hacking and the old school mods, dude. <laughs> hack your jewel in five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. But, uh, hmm? I, I think also this, this comes down to the whole thing. They're looking at technological means to try and separate people from nicotine that has never worked and never will people will use you know 
addictive substances, be it alcohol, be it drugs, be it nicotine, people will use it regardless of what the law says. I mean, heroin is, is banned entirely. There are millions of addicts in the United States. So still the very, very first port of call and resort, you know, for society to, to tackle it must be education and awareness. I, I don't think nicotine is a harmful drug, but people need to know what they're letting themselves in for. You know, if a 14-year-old if a starts dueling, he needs to know where, where is this addiction going to take him? What's it going to cost him? What effect is it going to have on its life? It might, it, you know, it won't give him cancer. It's not going to kill him. But does he want to get into a situation where he can't go anywhere without having his vape with him? Does he want to spend that amount of money on, on nicotine? As long as kids know that, then I, I think you've done what you can do, you know, the rest is going to be up to them. Yeah. I mean, that, that pretty much wraps up the show. Thanks, Richard. Um, I think, you know, the only questions that I have is, is really from um, the viewers, what they think of, of Jewel and uh, you know, all the points that we touched um, in the show, of course, there's been many. So, there's been the age verification. There's been the history of Jewel. There's been the success of the product. There's been the lawsuit addiction and kids. Um, so yeah, if you've got any, any comments or how you feel, you know, or what you think Jewel's next move should be, um, leave it down below in the comments and, you know, we'll have a bit of a chat around that. But thank you very much for listening to the show. Guys, is there anything else that you want to, to add here? I'm good. Cool. Cheers. Cheers, guys.